Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by Snap Terms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code twist for 10% off. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. What a great episode we're having here of This Week in Startups. I just love doing the show. I love learning and uh, having great guests. And uh, one of the products that I use in my companies, all of my companies, is New Relic. New Relic is the most awesome web and mobile app monitoring system. It makes all of your apps so much faster because it monitors the real-time user experience. And here you're seeing it on my screen. Let me just um, pull that up here. And you can see the browser load time based upon the page rendering and the network and the web application and the request queuing and memcache and how's that doing, the database, how's Ruby doing. And if things are out of whack and you, know, you have a 100 millisecond delay, I get these automatic emails to me and I just start just hit reply and I, the team's there and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And you can do code level um, app performance as you're seeing here, which parts of the code are taking the most time to execute, what percentage of the time, and what's the response time like, how much of the CPU are we using, all great stuff to know. And this really brings this responsiveness. And remember, Marissa Mayer and all the Google team were like, speed is the best feature, speed is the best feature. If you add speed, you, add, you increase usage. You add speed, reduce speed, or increase speed, reduce lag, increase usage. Just make it faster. People use it more. Everybody knows that. It's just one-on-one. But you need to have tools. And you know what? Leaving it in the hands of just a sysadmin and not having these kind of tools, you need to have a collaborative environment about this. That's what I love about you know, getting the resources sent by email. Everybody can see it. And you can obviously monitor server resources too. And you can see like, oh, well, this server that's running Ubuntu is, you know, got this much RAM and you know, this type of CPU, and here's how it's doing. Here's the network I.O. card. Maybe there's something wrong with at our uh, pop, and, you know, something's wrong with the, you know, router down there. We, we're going to know pretty quickly. They've got 40,000 customers and includes everybody, um, just everybody, Skull Candy, Spotify, Nike, Zillow, Bonage. I mean, these are people running, you know, very large websites, and they're relying on New Relic to keep them optimized. So developers across the spectrum trust their critical performance uh, to New Relic. And if you want a uh, super powered visibility uh, into all of your web and mobile apps, sign up today and you'll get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. Just go to newrelic.com slash twist. And when you go to newrelic.com slash twist, you just click and you'll get this free fan-made t-shirt. See, it's got the samurai sword there. Like I'm always saying, be a samurai and fight through all the problems in your startup. That's right. Just go to newrelic.com slash twist. And you will get this gorgeous twist T-shirt that was designed by one of our super fans. See, it's TWIST, This Week in Startups, with the samurai sword, as I'm always saying. Be a samurai. And it's a gorgeous, nice, weighty T-shirt um, from American Apparel. It's, this is not a cheap T-shirt. This is like, you know, 20, 30 beans. And you're going to get it free just by signing up. Uh, super fast, super easy, no credit card required. That's always um, the sign of a confident company. If they let you just try the product without trying to twist your arm into a contract like some of those other companies do, go to newrelic.com slash twist, newrelic.com slash twist. And I really, really appreciate at New Relic uh, supporting the program and supporting entrepreneurs. They make great product. They support the show. They support founders, uh, reasonably priced products. And just doing the t-shirt was a classy move. So thanks to my friends over at, at New Relic. Really appreciate the support on behalf of the entrepreneurs feature on the program and everybody who's watching it learning how to build better startups. And, you know, tools like at New Relic are critical to building better startups. Let's get back to this great program. Thanks, New Relic. Hands down, without question, the biggest success in the history of the event um, in the past six years now has been Yammer. Um, they launched on stage here just under four years ago. And... Um, the founder told me in the rehearsals um, that he was going to win and that his team was, had set their sights on winning. And he was, a, you know, a, at that time, a very successful executive. But he took the competition seriously. He put serious effort into it. He inspired his team 
to greatness, and they did win. And of course, a couple years later, they wound up winning, uh, you know, uh, amazing traction in the market. And it was just a fantastic, fantastic ride and excellent to see. So um, please welcome David Sachs of Yammer. All righty. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. You're back on the stage. Yep. And I think you remember this stage. I remember it very well. You're right. It was. You remember the room. This is the room. This is the room. This is the. Yes, exactly. We and um, we we actually launched on stage. We did like a countdown, where and we pressed the button and the site went up, and that was September 2008. So. Wow. Yeah. And we're sitting here five years later. Yeah. And the company's been sold. How do you reconcile this, like, you know, let's go through it, the actual five years of, you know, Yammer's existence and now to this tremendous exit to Microsoft. I think the, the numbers are public now, 1.2 or $3 billion exit. Right. Um, people were extremely critical of it when you launched. There was people who, on the judging panel, right. dismissed you. Right. Just like we saw today, people here getting creamed on the panel, Panel is saying, hey, it's not going to work, it's too simple, whatever. Mm -hmm. You did have, do you remember the reaction of the judges? Um, it was pretty mixed. Um, probably the judge, there's only one judge I remember being really enthusiastic about the idea, and that was uh, Mark Benioff, uh, to his credit. And uh, then he became a competitor. So that He was, launched Chatter. Yeah, that was less fun. <laughs> he was a really big uh, <laughs> Yeah, he was a really big fan. fan. So uh, much so he copied it pixel yeah. for pixel. Yeah. But no, he, he was, he was uh, one of the first people to see that social wasn't going to be limited to the consumer space, that it was going to want to come inside the enterprise as, as well as a business solution. And that's what, you know, that's what Yammer was trying to do. And I think the reason why people were dismissive of it is they thought that social networking was just a plaything, a toy. It was just for people's personal lives. What did you have for lunch? What, you know, what's, it's sort of personal news. And our view was that it was a form of communication and that it could be harnessed for business productivity. And so that was a really simple idea, but people were you know, very dismissive of it at the time. And as an entrepreneur, when you got that sort of mixed mm -hmm. to lukewarm at times reception, did that impact you and make you think for a moment, hey, maybe you know, these are judges, they've had some success, my vision is off? And, and how did you fight through that? Well, you know, as a result of the, the conference, we got uh, 50,000 users and 10,000 uh, company networks in one week. So we felt like the, the launch had been a tremendous success. And then, by the way, we, you know, we, we won the event. So yes. enough people liked it that, um, that uh, we felt really good about it. And so, you know, you don't really worry about the naysayers. You worry about, you know, are there people who, who see what you're trying to do and appreciate it? And we had enough of those that we felt really good about it. Now, people, I think, don't know this today, but Yammer was not the first idea of the company. There was a product that came before Yammer, and you pivoted into Yammer. Tell that story. Right, so, um, so you're referring to Genie, right. uh, which was creating a, a virally growing family tree, and the idea was to layer a family social network on top of it. And actually, we sold Genie last year to MyHeritage, so it, it's still a product that, that I love and believe in. Um, but, uh, but essentially what happened is that when we launched Genie, one of the first things people said to us is, that, you know, the virally growing family tree is a really cool idea. Could you do that with an org chart? Could you create a virally growing uh, org chart? And that planted a seed. And it got me thinking about, well, you know, this family social networking is pretty interesting, but it, would corporate social networking be an even better idea? And um, and so that idea started to kind of percolate, and it kind of came together really throughout 2007. Um, and, um, and by January 2008, we were actively coding it, and then we launched in September of, of that year. And um, when you get off the stage and you've you know, gotten all the kudos, what, what happens then? Did you have a ton of interest from venture capitalists? You already had financed the company pretty heavily from, I guess, Charles River Ventures. And was there another investor early on? A founders fund in Charles River had invested in Genie. And you know, one of the things that happened is we, we started Genie in the middle of 2006. We launched it in January of, of January 2007. 
by the end of 2008, we were in the middle of the financial crisis, and raising money was really hard. And I'm not sure that um, without winning the conference that, uh, I mean, we, we ultimately got the, f the fundraising done, and, and what happened is that Charles River essentially doubled down on us, and, um, and so they had a lot of conviction, and, and George Zachary, um, who's the, the VC there who was on our board, he was always very uh, positive about this idea and very enthusiastic. But, um, you know, we went out and kind of tested the market, and uh, it was a really hard time to raise money. I mean, I, I think if George hadn't stepped up and Founders Fund hadn't participated as well, it would have been hard, I think, to get this off the ground. So it could have not happened. It could have not happened, for sure. Wow. And what do you take away from that as an entrepreneur? What's the lesson there? Um, well, um, you know, there's nothing you can do about the fundraising environment. I mean, George has compared it to, to sunshine. You know, you make hay while the, while the sun shines. I, I tend to think that entrepreneurs raise money while you can because you can't control the macro environment. And, um, you know, uh, under normal circumstances, I think, you know, Yammer shouldn't have had trouble getting finance given that it had won this event. And, um, and you know, enough people liked the idea. And it had some good early traction. But um, you don't want to get caught in a situation where you know, there's like a recession or something, and all of a sudden you can't raise money. So take the money while you can. Yeah, and you get off stage, and then the hard work begins. Mm -hmm. um, you've got some users. What were the next three or four years about, you know, leading up until, you know, this tremendous, I remember at some point, you and I were driving in a car somewhere, and you said, yeah, we, we made a million dollars this quarter. And then we were driving a car six months later, and you said, yeah, we made $3 million this quarter. Right. And it was only within a couple of months of each other. And right. you were kind of in shock about how the revenue had ramped up. What was the right. revenue ramp up? And, and how did you actually get that? Because today we heard a right. lot of people saying, how are you going to make money um, to companies just like yours when you launched? And you know, what was your focus, and how did you get that revenue? Yeah. So I'd say the, the, the biggest area where we had to learn over that three-year time period was, was enterprise sales. Um, I didn't really know anything about it. Um, uh, my background's more in, in product development. And so we had to learn how to do enterprise sales. Um, when we started the company, we had this somewhat naive view that if we just went viral, that companies would pull out their credit card and buy it. And that works for S small, small businesses, it works for um, individuals, it does not work for enterprises. And it turns out that, um, and again, this is something that was a little bit surprising to us, is that enterprises were the ones who responded to, to Yammer the most. Because if you've got, it, it stands to reason, if you've got thousands of employees, you've got the biggest need for an internal company social network. Um, you've got the biggest sort of internal communication problems. So we had to learn how to do enterprise sales is, is a short answer to that. How did the Microsoft um, exit uh, come about? I mean, hmm. I'm assuming a company that was on that incredible um, run rate like you were at this moment in time when enterprise and, and bottom-up enterprise has become so huge must have had offers beforehand. What were the offers like leading up to Microsoft? When uh, was the first time you got an offer? You don't have to say from whom, but... Yeah, I mean, there, there, were, there were always some people who were kind of circling around and, and kind of sniffing around. And, um, you know, we, um, it, uh, it, it just never kind of materialized. You know, we were pretty heads down, focused on the company, and we weren't looking to be acquired. I mean, that's really the key thing, is that we never did anything to generate any interest or to shop the company or anything like that. When Microsoft came to us, um, you know, we had never really talked to them before. They came to us because of what they saw us doing in the market. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not the first one to say it, but I believe that companies are bought, not sold. I, you know, I generally don't think you get a good exit if you're out there trying to sell yourself. I think what has to happen is you're doing something interesting enough in the market that people come to you. What was that that Microsoft saw in the market? Were their own clients using the product? Mm -hmm. Was there something in your product that they felt would be disruptive to their existing businesses? What do you perceive to be that thing that made them notice you? Well, I, I think it started with the feedback they were getting from our mutual customers. So Microsoft's in virtually every enterprise, and all of a sudden they see Yammer exploding in a lot of, a lot of the, their customers. Uh, and, they're getting really, and they're hearing really good things from those customers about, about the tool. Uh, and then, you know, Yammer represented a few themes that I think um, 
are really important to Microsoft. The consumerization of IT, um, the viral freemium model, uh, moving to the cloud, um, you know, uh, bringing social into the, the, into the workplace. Those are all themes of you know, intense interest to, to Microsoft right now. Um, and during that time, you had raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, two or three rounds of financing. I think it was like five, probably. We, we raised $142 million uh, over... In four years. In um, basically in three and a half years. So right after the launch conference, we, we raised that first round from, from George. That was $5 million. Then the next round was a year later that we raised $10 million from Emergence Capital, who are kind of specialists in, in, in uh, enterprise SaaS. And then we raised... Um, uh, 25 million, like the next year, from uh, Mamoun Hamid, who was at USCP, and then later joined Chamath, and then Chamath put in another 15. So wait, wait, Mamoun, <laughs> yeah. who was at USVP, invested right. at USVP. Right. He left to join Chamath at Social Capital Partnership, right. and he, he then invested as. Yeah, they they topped off kind of. Wow. And I mean, uh, that's a big. Um, I guess that's very uh, complimentary of you as an entrepreneur that. They, somebody moves from one VC firm to another and says, we got to invest again at a higher valuation and, right. you know, get in here. It, um, yes, I mean, all, like our board members were, were happy. They were seeing good things from the inside. And, um, um, you know, I think the, uh, the ones who did the best were the ones who kept doubling down. Um, and then, you know, the final round was three months before the Microsoft deal, we raised $85 million. And that was the first round where... I would say it got kind of easy to raise money. But honestly, prior to that, uh, we never had more than one or two term sheets uh, per round. Um, you know, I give our VCs a lot of credit um, for, you know, believing in, in what we were trying to do. Because, you know, we had some proof, but it's not like it was, uh, you know, obvious to everybody else until basically last year. The people who put money in last, mm -hmm. they then saw you sell the company three months later. Right. What kind of return did those people get in 90 days? Well, they more than doubled their money in, in, 30, in 90 days, so they were all pretty, wow. pretty happy. On an IRR basis, that's probably like the best anyone's ever going to do. 100% in three months would be 400% in a year. Yeah, I mean, it was like even that. a little bit more. It was like 120% or something like that. Right, so 500% a year yeah. would be the, uh, if you could ever right. emulate. So they put in $85 million one month. Right. Three months later, they get back $200 million or so. Mm -hmm. Pretty good return for them. Yeah. Um, and so... And that, was, that was led by DFJ Growth. Um, so uh, it, they were really great to work with, too. Looking back on this journey as an entrepreneur, what do you think the things you focused on um, correctly, mm -hmm. and then obviously the follow-up to that is, what are the things that, looking back on it, you would say, gosh, I should have course-corrected quicker and faster and leaned into right. X? Well, I think just to... Um, continue on the financial theme, the reason why we raise so much money is because, you know, I'm not actually a believer in the lean startup idea once you kind of get some traction. So I believe that, you know, when you're in the early stages, the very experimental creative stage, it's good to be very lean, have a small team. You're sp throwing spaghetti against the wall, seeing what sticks. But once something sticks, I believe that you have to basically pour as much like gasoline on that fire as possible, like as fast as you can. Because somebody, because people are going to copy it, you know, you saw that, you know, uh, Mark Manioff was on stage, he saw his launch and he's like, that's a good idea, I want to, you know, we need to learn from that. So you've got to, when something actually sticks and it's rare that it happens, you've got to like move as quickly as possible. And part of that, that's the reason why we kept raising money. We were like, we got to raise as much money as possible, we got to grow as quickly as possible, we got to expand the sales operation as much as possible. So. Uh, you know, we went from lean to, to fat, like, really quickly, and that, um, I think you've got to do that if you have something that's working. And I'm assuming when you see Mark Benioff putting, like, an ad in the Wall Street Journal every day for chatter, when I saw that, that immediately said to me, wow, obviously Yammer is a very sustainable idea if Benioff is putting an ad in the journal every day. As an entrepreneur, when you wake up, somebody as, you know, talented as Benioff is, right. decides he wants to be in your space. Mm -hmm and he's putting it in the Wall Street Journal every day, what does that do to your management team? Do they all of a sudden panic and go, oh my God? And how do you calm them down? Right. Well, um, first of all, it is tremendous validation, you know? And um, I, I think at the end of the day, the way that, that Salesforce implemented 
uh, their product was, was different enough that, um, that, than the way we did it, but it was still something to obviously be pretty concerned about, and you have to use that to motivate your team and, um, and to get them to move faster, I mean, for sure. Um, you wrote a piece on Facebook, it was kind of a throwaway piece, mm -hmm. that, you, you know, I don't know if it was written on a Saturday night or a Sunday <laughs> night or something, just kind of off the cuff, and it wasn't like published anywhere, but it was something to the effect that, you know, the age of startups is going to get much more difficult because these big companies are getting so effective at launching new products. What was your thesis there? Because you got a very strong reaction. Right. I saw Mark Andreessen, you know, yeah. came in hard to, to sort of counter you. Right. What was the thinking there? Well, you know, I guess one way to put it would be no entrepreneur wants to create a product that's just a feature of something else, right? You want to create a product that can be a, a company, you know? And the difference that I see now between, you know, when I first got in the business and, you know, like 1999, I'm like the old man now, it's like 1999 with PayPal, is that you do have these huge internet companies, you know, and I mentioned, you know, five of them. So, you know, there's Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, right? And they've got so much surface area to their products that it's kind of easier than ever before for them to kind of featureize you, right? So that's the bad news. But I think there's a lot of good news as well, which is that, and this is, you know, Andreessen's point, software is eating the world. So there's more spaces than ever before for software to go. And we're seeing entire industries that were never technology industries all of a sudden be disrupted. So, you know, two years ago, who would have thought that the taxicab industry would be an internet business? And now it is, thanks to Uber. Uh, you know, another company I invested in uh, called Howes is disrupting the, uh, the market for home remodeling and design. So I love these businesses that are transforming non-tech industries into tech industries. And so I think there's just tons of opportunity for entrepreneurs to do stuff like that. And so I don't want to seem pessimistic. I'm very optimistic about that. Um, but I do think you've got to watch out for this, um, you know, this sort of uh, the four or five horsemen's product surface area type, type problem. And as an entrepreneur, how do you do it? How do, how do you actually navigate that? Right. I guess well, you know, part of it is the initial idea selection. You know, I think you choose a space that's kind of um, as far removed from what they're doing. You, you, I mean, to start with, Try not to pick an idea that's going to be on their two-year product roadmap, you know, or something you can guess is pretty obviously on their near-term product roadmap. Um, I think the other thing you have to do is, I mean, the reality is that when you first launch, your product is easy to copy. I and mean, when we first launched Yammer, uh, you know, it, there, it was easy to copy. It was a three-month-old product. Well, we, 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 had, we, had, um, we developed the initial version in three months. We dog fooded for six months. So basically, it had been... It had been uh, in development for nine months, okay? And, but it had been in nine months with a team of, you know, um, a handful of people, less than 15 people. So the reality is a big company, if they had moved fast enough, could have crushed us. So what we did is, we, like I was told you before, we moved as quickly as possible to add depth to our product, surface area to the product, so that two years later, by the time that, you know, Salesforce or whoever was trying to do those Super Bowl commercials, like, it wasn't the same product anymore. You know, they, they were, they had basically copied our product circa 2008, we were on to Yammer 2010, and the difference was big enough that people in the market could see it. And so, that's, that's part of it is, is the initial idea selection combined with just, you got to move maniacally to, to basically when it's working to make sure that people can't just copy you easily. So. Is it easier today or harder today? I mean, you've been in the business for, you know, a long time. Um, entrepreneurship, we hear about the lower cost of starting a business, but what you're telling us is something completely different. Maybe lower to start, but when you do hit something, it's going to be $100 million in funding and ramming and jamming it, you know, to scale. Is it harder or easier in your estimation? I think it's gotten, uh, on the whole, like, especially if you look on a multi-decade time frame, it's gotten much, much easier. I mean, there's so much more infrastructure now in Silicon Valley. Um, it's like, it's almost like these, AP, you know, Sand Hill Road is like this financing API that any entrepreneur can plug into. You know, I was watching, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to kind of get an early screening of um, Ashton Kutcher's movie on Steve Jobs. Right. And, um, I, you know, I loved it, by the way. I thought he did a great, great job. 
And the thing that really came across in that movie, they spent a lot of time focusing on the early days, like how Apple got founded with Jobs and Wozniak, and uh, how they got Mike Markula to write them their first check. And the negotiation was, you know, Mike Markula is like, all right, I'm going to give you $90,000. And Steve Jobs is like, okay, but I want a $300,000 valuation. And, uh, you know, it's like the values changed so much. And, you know, <laughs> and, and they show Jobs ma making hundreds of phone calls to land Markula, you know. It was so hard, you know. It, it's, it's almost like um, Steve Jobs was like this civil rights pioneer for entrepreneurs who, like, made it so much easier for all the rest of us who right. came later. And so I just think it's gotten, it's so much easier on every level. There's so many resources that, you know, we have conferences like this. Um, you know, we, we had, there's the, the VC community is so much more developed. You've got websites and, and blogs that make knowledge transfer so much easier. So, I mean, look, we all have it way easier than, you know, th than the trailblazers who invented this industry, like the Jobses and the Gateses. What do, you, what do you think it means for America as a country, mm -hmm. you know, internally, how society is, does seem to be changing, where the network effect is hitting people in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, other places, and just skyrocketing them in efficiency and also wealth creation, and then other areas are flatlined. Right. And then taking it out a step and looking at America versus the world, because I know you do think about the big picture. Well, this is the most... What we're, what's happening in tech is clearly the most optimistic thing happening in America. I mean, this is the economy of the future. I think the fact that it's spreading into all these other industries, that you now have this culture of entrepreneurship that, you know, uh, w when I graduated from Stanford in, in, uh, in 1994, political science was the most popular major. And today it's computer science. And that is like a total sea change in, in the way, you know, when I graduated, I didn't even know that like entrepreneurship was an option. Now we got, you know, these kids graduating from school and they've seen the social network and they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg and they already know how to negotiate the valuation for their Series A and I mean... Yeah, they've had three term <laughs> sheets before they got accepted to college. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think this is like the most positive thing happening in America and it's the, ba it's, it's the basis of American competitiveness in the world and um, it's, it's the basis of our future economy, the transitioning to this um, information economy from sort of an industrial economy. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Let me talk to you some, about something very important. I just had Odea Ressi on the program, and we were talking. It's like, hey, what's that company that does like the terms of service, and they don't charge you like $10,000? Oh, Snap Terms. It's the greatest tool. And he's like, we need this because we're blowing so much of our angel money on terms of service, and the lawyers are so afraid to do them, and they don't like doing doing them, and there's got to be a better way. That better way is Snap Terms. You can follow at Snap Terms on Twitter. If you don't have a proper terms and privacy policy, you are risking costly litigation. But if you hire one of those big firms, you're risking blowing 10 dimes. Not a, not a good situation you're in. That's great entrepreneurship on Snap Terms part. They built a better product. They built a better mousetrap. And I myself use it. If you go to thisweekend.com, you'll see, uh, thisweekend.com slash legal, you'll see our very funny and clever terms of service where they make little cute jokes and t say hello to you, guten tag and everything. And they just plain English, explain to you what the terms of service is. So, you know, those ambulance driving lawyer, law firms that are trying to, like, attack startups, they got no chance against the SNAP terms, uh, terms of service and privacy policy. And you need to take this seriously. Go to snapterms.com to get started. Terms start at only $299. I know, that's not a typo. I didn't say $299, $2,999, which would be reasonable. That'd be a third of the cost of law firms. No, $299. They even have custom solutions for more complex businesses. Use the coupon code TWIST and you'll get 10% off your order. Bonus, forward your Snap Terms confirmation email to snapterms.launch.co and you will be automatically entered into winning an iPad mini signed by at Jason. Hey, that's me. Um, I don't know. Who the hell wants an autographed iPad mini for me? I mean, I, I want the iPad mini. I don't, you don't need my signature on it. But hey, I'll autograph it. What the hell? I'll write whatever you want in there. I'll write that your startup is the best startup ever created. Uh, and even better than Facebook. Whatever. Snap Terms, thank you for making a great product that helps entrepreneurs. And I'm so lucky on this program. We have our choice of sponsors to work with. We have a choice of partners. We only allow people whose products we stand behind, that I, Jason Calacana, stand behind, and I believe in, to participate in the program. And guess what? It works. Whitelisted advertising works. I'm a genius. I created this concept like three years ago, and I said, I only want advertisers on the program who I love their products because I got to read the goddamn ads. 
I can't be sitting here reading an ad for something and lie to you guys. You know I'm not going to do that. The e-cigarette company was the, was the first asking. And then there was that other one with the, you know, Fugazi, um, what was it? Like the Fugazi, uh, the Fugazi, uh, you know, protect your identity nonsense. And I was like, you know what? Type their name into Google and then type scam at the end. And yeah, I'm not going to read an ad for something that people consider a scam. I'm not going to do it, smoke an e-cigarette on the show. I would never, I mean, the guy lit up one of those, you don't light them up. Some guy at the poker table started puffing on a blueberry, blueberry e-cigarette at the casino. And I'm like, guy, he's like, well, it's not smoke. I'm like, it just stinks like blueberry. No stinky blueberry cigarettes on the show, but great products. Yes. Great products we use. Absolutely. And this whitelisted advertising is one of the great things in my career I've ever done. It allows me to read ads for things like snap terms that i believe in thank you at snap terms for making a great product i cannot tell you how many times i'm at a conference or i'm walking at a, into a cafe in san francisco or the bay area or on university or in los angeles and somebody says hey i use snap terms thanks for letting me know about that you saved me 10 dimes jason i said great i saved you 10 dimes how about you kick back one just kidding don't kick back one we'll play you a high card for it okay listen enough I'm bantering again, and they tell me stop bantering on the show. Let's get back to this great episode, and let's all thank at Snap Terms on our Twitter account for making privacy policies and terms of service easy and affordable. And just let us sleep well at night knowing those goddamn ambulance chasing law firms aren't going to try to ruin our startups and our hopes and dreams. Thank you at Snap Terms. Yeah, and what do you think our government has done over the last 10 years in, in terms of fostering it or not, or can it have any impact? I mean, we see the Obama administration and Silicon Valley, I mean, they seem to be perpetually at lunch together. If my path is any indication, I think Obama lives like, you know, on University Avenue or something. You would think they would move the White House there. Is the government helping, hurting, or, or indifferent in this sort of regard? Can they, can they even have an impact? People talk about immigration, taxes, right. et cetera. What's your take on the government's role? Well, I think there is a short list of stuff that Silicon Valley needs, like the, you know, the, 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 um, the immigration, the, the you know, H-1B visas, um, making it way easier for us to keep and attract engineering talent globally, hugely important. We all know that. That's been on the short list for a long time. I think the whole crowdfunding legislation was on the Silicon Valley short list for a while. I think patent reform is another one where, you know, that's really important. How would you reform that patent? I mean, what would, what would David Sachs's well, agenda be? You've been sued yeah. by patent trolls or no? Yeah, I have. So, you know, a patent troll is, is, is someone who hasn't created anything, but they've bought up some patent that, um, you know, and who knows what it even means because these things are written in this like legal gobbledygook. Uh, but then they sue you uh, on the grounds that supposedly you've um, infringed their patent. And, you know, I would say that I think there's a lot of ways to, to skin this cat. I mean, I think you could say that, you know, if you haven't actually created the product, I mean, I'm not sure you should have uh, standing to sue someone who actually has created a product. Um, I mean, we know that, and I think everyone here knows that the hard part about being an entrepreneur is not like sitting in a room brainstorming an idea, it's actually like creating the thing. Yes. And um, if you didn't execute it, what grounds do you have to sue somebody who has? I mean, that's the thing that's really annoying. So I think that's one idea. I think another idea is that you shouldn't be able to sue someone for, um, for like a, uh, an idea, like a, like a feature idea. Like, you know, we all know that some of these like crazy patents have been issued for like, you know, uh, advertising on a website, you know, yeah. like back in the days. Downloading a video off the yeah. internet. Yeah. So the, the idea for a feature shouldn't be copyable, uh, shouldn't be patentable in my opinion, but the, um, the code should be protected. I, I do not, I don't believe in piracy, um, you know, I think, but we have copyright protection for that. So, um, but I, I, I do think that it, it, it stands in the way of innovation if, if an idea for something can be owned by a company. That's just not what the patent system was set up to do. And Nathan Mirvold, considered, you know, a very talented guy and now considered the world's largest patent troll, is bringing inventors together, brilliant people, and saying brainstorm with lawyers in the room to then file it with no intention of doing it. And right. his claim is, well, the inventors deserve credit for inventing. And that's all we want is our credit. Well, an inventor used to be somebody like Alexander Graham Bell or Thomas Edison, somebody who actually like, created the thing, not sat in a room and talked about it. Right. So the definition of inventor in that case is wildly um, optimistic. 
yeah. Coming up with well, an idea. Yeah. I, you know, to invent, you actually have to create something. You know, it's not about uh, creating a, filing a piece of paper. I've um, introduced, since you're an angel investor and I'm an angel investor, a lot of companies to you. I watch you evaluate their ideas pretty quickly. Um, what do you think when you look at, I don't know how many angel investments you've done. Um, do you? Um, I, I'm not sure. Like dozens, I guess. But dozens, okay. Yeah. Um, what is typically the thing that entrepreneurs lack? What is the thing they need to work on? Is there a right. thing that you see over and over again where you say, hey, if you do this, you're going to Right. Get there. Well, you know, I've, I've kind of, um, there's four things that I think a startup entrepreneur, or that I look for in an idea. And it's frequently the case that at least one of them is missing. Um, and by the way, I think if you can just get to like three out of four, it's, I'd, you know, I'd be happy enough to invest because you can usually figure out the last one. Let me just quickly run through them. So the first thing I look for is a product hook, right? It's a simple way to engage with the product that I can see people realistically you know, like it's a realistic user behavior. You know, uh, for Yammer, it was, what are you working on? We took that status update, adapted it for a business context, right? With, with Genie, it was creating a, a, a family tree by clicking arrows. And with PayPal, it was email, typing in someone's email address and a credit card. And they were all simple behaviors that, you know, that I thought people could get hooked on, right? So there's, that product hook is number so one. So it's, it's you're calling it a product hooked, right. but it's a behavior that people do. It's an atom of behavior it's a, it's a, that builds your right. product. It's a, it's a starting point because, you know, if you don't have a simple, way, simple interaction to get people started, layering on a whole bunch of other features, like power user features, that's not going to help you. So right. it's, it's all about getting that. It's, it's, it's the wedge. It's the onboard. It's the bootstrap. It's just that little thing that gets the whole, the whole thing moving. And it has to be a believable uh, interaction. Now, you know, if they've already launched the product, you can see it in their numbers, but if they haven't launched the product, it just has to be a simple product hook, again, that's just what I call it, that I, I believe that a typical user will engage in. So th that would be like number one, okay? Number two is they're solving some market problem that actually exists or th there's, there's some need for this thing in the abstract, right? And, you know, the product hook and the market need are kind of opposite ways to, to come at it. Frequently, I'll see an entrepreneur start with the market need. And they'll be exactly right about that. They'll point to some market that's, like, horribly broken and needs a solution, but they won't have productized it in a way that I believe any user will actually interact with. And then sometimes you'll get, you know, a product that's got a hook, but they're kind of groping towards what the real problem is they're solving. And I'd almost rather invest in that because, you know, I take that, like, I take the product that the... the um, you take the hook, not I'll the take, market. I'll take, I'll, take the, um, I'll take the traction and believe you can grope towards the market need and, and, and figure out the business model, right? Because that shows the person has the ability to make a good hook. I think, good I think the hook is harder than identifying a market need, basically. I mean, anybody can identify a market right. need. You just look right. around you and say, what sucks? Right. That's true, but you, sometimes you have to iterate towards what that is. Like, you know, it wasn't probably clear, like, day one when Twitter launched you know, or even Facebook, like how it get to be a business, but... Um, they had a good hook. Yeah, they had a great hook. So, um, and so then we got they the hook, the we got the market. Right, the third is a distribution model. Ah, how does it spread? How does it spread? And distribution is probably the single hardest component, I think, of creating a startup. Um, you know, what I look for is virality. You know, I want the users to recruit other users on some level. All the products that I've uh, been involved in building, PayPal, Genie, Yammer, have all been viral on some level. And, you know, the basic problem is you can build something great, but it's a big internet out there. How are people going to find it? So you've got to figure that out. And sales is prohibitively expensive to, for most startups. Marketing, like advertising, prohibitively expensive. So how are you going to do it? It's actually a really difficult problem. And um, so th that's, that's one of the really big things I look for. And what was the fourth? The fourth is what I would describe as non-copyability. So, um, so we talked about, you know, okay, you launch something, you throw the spade against the wall, it sticks, great. Now, why isn't somebody else just going to copy it and commoditize you? And the thing about software is it's very easy to copy, right? I don't mean pirate. I'm not saying someone has to steal your code. All they got to do is look at what you do, and they're like, oh, I can build this. So if other people are going to be building it, you know, how are you going to, what makes your uh, product fundamentally non-copyable, and the best is a network effect, right? It's like, you know, eBay, like a marketplace type effect, or a, or a Metcalf's Law type thing like, like Facebook, or it could just be, 
you know, if your first mover advantage is, is strong enough, you know, like, you know, I'll go back to Salesforce. You know, I'm not sure that Salesforce has a network effect per se, but Mark Benioff saw the cloud so much earlier that, I mean, he had like a multi-year head start. And I think, so the first mover can be very big as well. Right, and then but, once people are trained up on the product and they know right. how to use Salesforce, when they go right. to the next company and they, and that person then is already trained in Salesforce, it was like the old days when somebody had used Goldmine or whatever the right. CRM software was, they're going to be like, oh, where's Goldmine? Where's Salesforce? Or I know right. Excel, why don't you have Excel? Right. They become your product evangelists. Yeah, exactly. so you can build, you can build a, a community that spreads your product, they're sort of, um, you know, there's sort of complementary network effects where, like, if all the salespeople learn how to use your product, then, you know, it becomes a, or, you know, your product can become a standard or something like that. So you want to have some basis for believing that uh, the market, uh, that you can win the market and that it won't just uh, erode to a bunch of uh, copycats. If you could own either of the following two companies, which one would it be and why, Twitter or YouTube? Well, YouTube's owned by no, Google just, now. No, I'm just, if you could. Okay. Hypothetical. Um, gosh, those are both super attractive businesses. Right. Um, you know, I, I invested in Twitter last year. I'm super bullish on that. Right. Um, and if I could invest in YouTube, I guess I would. So that was too close to call? That one's too close to call, yeah. Facebook or Twitter? Which one is going to be more important? Which one would you rather own today? Uh, a share of one, a share of another. Right. Well, you know, I think they're both important, but what I would say is on a uh, relative pricing basis, um, one of the reasons I bought uh, Twitter last year is that the, the gap between Facebook's valuation and Twitter's was eight to one. So if you look at Facebook on a fully diluted basis, it's about an $80 billion valuation. Twitter secondary shares are about 10. And I, I'm not sure exactly what the spread should be, but I think eight, eight X is way too, too great. Maybe Facebook should be two to three times as valuable as Twitter. So the catch-up will happen. I think, I think that gap will, will compress. Um, what, what are your thoughts on... Um, and just, just the reason is, yeah. just to complete the thought, I, I basically think that what happened over the last few years is that Twitter peeled away the value of public sharing that could have or should have or maybe at one point belonged to Facebook. But, you know, when I was watching the Super Bowl and I, was, I toggled between my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed and, you know, the Twitter feed was much more engaging. It was like real time, everyone was talking about the Super Bowl and the halftime disaster or whatever. Yeah. And I love Facebook too. It's the way that I stay in touch with my family and friends. But, uh, but Twitter has really peeled away that public sharing. And I, I just think it's, you know, incredibly valuable. What are your thoughts on Google today? Larry Page, Sergey, it seems to hit an all time high. Like every right. week, it seems to be hitting an all time high. Why is Google doing so well? Well, obviously, it starts with um, their sort of the, the, their advertising system. Their ad platform is a very sort of core, uh, robust business model. But um, they, they seem to just have moved on to this incredibly ambitious phase where they're getting their fingers into everything and enough other stuff is working. You know, one of the um, sort of the I'd say that for Google's first um, maybe 10 years or so, the salutary myth that they promoted was this idea that, um, that they really prospered when they kicked people off of Google to your site as quickly as possible. And so right. Google would be, it's sort of this whole don't be evil, they're going to be this like very unbiased navigation system for the web. And I think over the last few years that's really changed and now you know, they're, they're basically they want everything. everything. They want everything. Yeah, Google take they want everything. everything. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like right. sports scores, right. you know, ticketing, movie right. times, and it right. was a gap. I mean, right. obviously the YouTube purchase. Right. They've moved organic search halfway down the page. Right. I mean, being number one in a search ranking in organic results means nothing today if the top of the fold is Google services and products. Yeah, and so they've gotten, you know, very aggressive about branching out to new areas and capturing a lot of the, the value for themselves. And, um, and then you've got to give them credit for, like you said, the YouTube acquisition, the Android acquisition. Those are probably two of the most successful tech acquisitions in the last decade. Well, and speaking of Microsoft, Skype was a pretty great one as well. Yeah. Skype and Yammer seem to be the right. corollaries people are having with Microsoft. Yeah, so Microsoft's done a great job as well. Um, if you do say so yourself. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, they did, but Skype, yes. But, yeah. And Yammer is obviously yeah. close second to that in terms of uh, the scope. What do you think now that you're inside of Microsoft? I, I recently got Windows 8. I got a Windows 8 phone, tablet, 
uh, and a laptop, and I started playing with it. <coughs> I was pretty um, impressed with how awesome the Windows 8 interface is, mm -hmm. and that it's the same app store and same interface and right. same cloud <coughs> across all three. Have people counted Microsoft out a little bit too soon? Well, you know, first let me just uh, set up the appropriate disclaimers. Yes, because, of course, you don't um, speak for Microsoft. I don't speak for Microsoft. I'm just here. These are my own views, and I'm not even in I, the uh, the Microsoft Office division is the division that acquired Yammer. Right. So, um, so I, you know, I can I can talk maybe with you know a, a little bit more uh, uh, of an insider's perspective about Office. I have none of that at all with respect to Windows. Not part of that division. I would say that you know the thing that's very innovative about again this is a bystander a, a, about Windows 8 is that it is a single operating system across all devices and um, I think that's clearly the the right direction and um, it'll be really interesting to see what what the other guys do about that. Yeah, and moving on to Apple, stock price got crushed recently. iPhone orders, people are wondering, hey, maybe the iPhone's best days are behind it. Right. What, what's your take on that with the iPhone? I mean. Do you feel like Android has caught up and has parity now? I mean, most, right. how many people here are iPhone users? And then how many are Android users? Wow, that is yeah. almost, it felt like 60 40? What yeah. Would you say? Yeah, yeah, looks like it. So. Okay, let's do two years ago. Two years ago, how many people were iPhone users? Two years ago, how many people were Android users? Wow, that's significant because just for the people who are watching on the live stream, it was 60%, 40% iPhone to Android today, but two years ago, that looked like, what, 80-20 to you? Mm -hmm. Maybe 70, about 80-20 two yeah. years ago, so that, that's a big switch. Yeah. Well, I think you wrote a great blog about this. I think that it seems like Apple is just repeating the same mistakes it made in the 90s where, you know, they're, they're overly concerned with um, uh, maintaining uh, margins on the hardware, and so as a result, they have, you know, that, it, part of it's a business model problem, right? I mean, they make money off the hardware, not the software, and so um, they're being undercut, essentially, by a, a product that's, or a union, which is, um, you know, Google, Samsung, that is a cheaper, it's a cheaper product, and, um, you know, th I, think, I think they should probably care less about margins and more about market share. But, um, you know, and I think you made a similar point, and, and I think they probably have to try, uh, you know, there's a great article on, on TechCrunch the other day with, uh, there was a fancy designer who created a, a, a phablet for Apple. I don't know if you guys saw that. It was yeah. some of the best fancy design I've seen. And, you know, it's one thing when Steve Jobs says, look, this is our product line, you know, it's like Moses coming down from the mountain, and it's like the Ten Commandments. But, you know, uh, now that, they're, on, they're sort of on the next stage, uh, I think it, it probably would make sense to be a little bit more experimental and, and you know, clearly people want these like super large uh, devices. Yeah, the Note 2 is becoming yeah. addicting. I have yeah. one and this sort of phablet is a terrible, ridiculous name to say. Yeah. You look so weird when you put that to yeah. your head. I don't know yeah. if anybody, anybody with a Note 2, can you just put it to your head for a second and we can see how ridiculous <laughs> you look? I mean, it's, but, I don't know how to, look, there it is. But people, that was an iPad mini, Owen. Business Insider. Yeah. I just like the fact that Business Insider is in the front row and they're just getting dogged every like two panels. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, look, I, I, if, I'm gonna, if you want me to play fantasy, you know, Baseball? armchair yeah. uh, quarter, armchair CEO, you know, I think Apple should consider doing some radical stuff like licensing the operating system, yeah. you know, or uh, coming out with a phablet or, yeah. you know, uh, having a more complete product, product line. Um, let's talk about the best CEOs in the business. I'll leave Bomber aside because I don't want to get you in trouble with Microsoft. But Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Zuckerberg, rank them. <laughs> uh, gosh, that, that's, that's really hard. But I, you know, I, I will give Steve a plug. You know, uh, you know, he he was really Bill Gates' de facto co-founder in the company. I don't think he gets enough credit for that. I mean, he yeah. joined like when there were less than thirty employees, and was. You know, Gates' has partnered throughout the whole growth of Microsoft and... Um, yeah, survived a couple of decades and every five years it was the death of Microsoft and it just right. has never happened. So he yeah, does get credit for something. Well, and the, the financial results of the company over the last 10 years have been phenomenal. I mean, they've basically grown revenue from like 30 billion to 75 billion and they've got, you know, they, they do some, spend out like 30 billion a year of profits. So, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been um, certainly by the numbers a very successful right. tenure. Um, 
On to, to, the, to the guys you mentioned. Because um, I would say pound yeah. for, oh, I should probably put Larry Page in there, yeah. I don't you know, know. They, 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 all, they all, obviously they're all great CEOs in, in different ways and, um, you know, uh, and, and they're all founder CEOs. They have a special, you know, insight into their business. So let's just go through each one and you just tell me what you think if we're not going to rank them. <laughs> Bezos. Right. What do you think? Amazon, what they've done? Just Amazon and Bezos in general, go. Right. I, I guess what's impressive about them is, um, is the... Um, is again, this, this, the, just 10 years ago, they were just trying to get the, the basic e-commerce business, the book business to work, and now they've been able to really expand the surface area of what they do. So now, you know, they've got Amazon Web Services, they're basically going into every category of e-commerce, uh, you know, they've got their own device. It's, um, you know, it's impressive that they've been able to expand like that. What do you think when you see them ship a hundred million dollars to make movies or, you know, studio, they have Amazon Studios now. Mm -hmm. And you did a film. You did Thank You for right. Smoking, which won Sundance. Correct? Did it win Sundance or it, what did it win? Something like, yeah. We, it won a couple of yeah. awards. We got nominated um, for a Golden Globe and Golden Globe an Independent Spirit of... Award. And, yeah. Uh, when you see Amazon just shipping, you know, right. hundreds of millions of dollars into original content creation, what do you think? Good move or pocket change? What's the thinking there? Well, you know, I would say it's a horrible thing for a startup to do, but when you get to Amazon size and you're a $100 billion company, you can kind of take flyers like that. And so, um, you know, in general, I'm pretty skeptical of the content creation business, but, um, but they have the ability to kind of place bets like that. And so, you know, I think, again, when you're running a company that big, you, you now have the luxury of not having to worry about like dying every day the way that you know you do when you're a startup like you know all of us are kind of running and you can do things that you can place a bunch of different bets knowing that some of them aren't necessarily going to work out. Take some moonshots. Yeah. Uh, Larry Page. Right. Speaking of moonshots, self-driving right. cars, Google Glass, Larry and Sergey, what do you think? Right. Um, I mean, it's it's, it's the same. It's, it's sort of the same analysis that the reason why we're talking about these guys is they've been able to really expand the the surface area of what of what they do. What has Marissa got to do at Yahoo to make it turn around? It, can it be done? Right. Um, in general, I don't believe that tech turnarounds are possible. And just in general, because um, uh, because once the ice has melted under your feet, it's strategically it's just too it's it's too hard to fix it. Um, the tech markets move so quickly that by the time you realize that you've lost your product market fit, it's just like almost impossible to fix it. The only turnaround story that we all talk about that I know of in the tech industry is, is, uh, is Jobs with Apple, and he was kind of, you know, one of a kind. So, um, so honestly, like, you know, it, those turnaround situations are incredibly tough. Um, now, with respect to Yahoo specifically, um, I, like, I like what I've heard Marissa say so far, this idea of daily habits, that she's, she's it, it's, it's a great way to recognize what Yahoo has historically been very good at and align it with where the market is today. So I like what I'm hearing so far about that, and uh, we'll just have to see kind of when how When she it goes. cut the telecommuting thing, yeah. the 350 people, and supposedly like not a lot of VPN activity, right. do you think she was getting overly criticized because she's a female founder maybe, uh, or that any CEO would have gotten that criticism of letting, because it is a, such a small fraction of the workforce. Why did that become such a brouhaha? Well, I, um, you know, I, I, I don't know that, she was initially treated differently than other CEOs would be, but I would say, I would defend that decision. I mean, I like her decision a lot. Um, Why? Well, because, like you said, they did the data and they, you know, they're seeing all these people working from home and they're never logging in and, you know, no one can tell what they do. So, <laughs> pretty you know, easy decision. It's a pretty easy decision. I mean, what is everyone complaining about? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to me. And to be honest, you know, we, I, in the past, uh, the companies I've been involved in, we've absolutely had work from home situations, but they've been situations, not policies. It's always been negotiated with the person, you know, and we know them and we trust them and we talk about how this is going to work. It's not just this idea that, hey, I don't have to ever come into work. I mean, that's a crazy policy. It's kind of insane, yes. It's insane. And, you know, it's not just about your productivity, it's about, you know, work collaborating and working with others. You know, what if somebody else at the office? needs to talk to you about something, you know. It's nice for people to be able to just swing by your desk, you know. Yeah, have and, a cup and of coffee. Sometime, or, you know, happen to see you in the cafeteria and you guys have lunch. It's not just about 
your productivity at home. It's also about being able to collaborate with your coworkers at the office. And um, so, you know, even though you know Yammer is a product that helps people, uh, you know, be uh, collaborate sort of virtually, um, I still believe in the benefits of of being in person in the same office. Um, you worked with Elon Musk at PayPal, right? What do you think of what he's accomplished in the last three or four years? I mean, it's, it's uh, obviously unbelievable. I mean, he's probably the world's best applied engineer. Um, I don't know anybody else who could design a reusable rocket and a battery-powered car and do it at the same time. You yeah. Know, that would be enough to kill most, most people. And um, so it's just, you know, it's an unbelievable design feat. It's an unbelievable uh, feat of, um, of, I think, leadership to convince uh, the, the investors that he, he needed a, a massive amount of investment uh, and he needed to create huge teams to do that. So being able to like pull all of that together and then finally, you know, he basically, you know, risked his whole net worth on his venture. So he I don't went know, broke. He, yeah, basically. Well, I mean, he publicly yeah. said he went yeah. broke and he yeah. was living off of loans yeah. from friends. Yeah. So I think, you know, of, of the list you mentioned, I mean, I think he's the gutsiest. He's got to be the gutsiest entrepreneur we know. Hands down. Hands down. And the best applied engineer yeah. that we know. Yeah. Interesting. What's next for David Sachs? You obviously are working at Microsoft. Are you the next CEO of Microsoft? <laughs> am, I, am I sitting here with the next bomber? Or did they? <laughs> no, I mean. I mean, at some point in the next 10 years, he'll retire. Is that something you th consider? Uh, you know what? I'm just focused on, on Yammer right now. and. Um, that's, that's flattering that you would say that, but, you know. Well, I mean, I think that a lot of us think it, you know, like you see someone like you from the Valley, you feel like the heir to Gates and to Bomber. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people who, you know, have, have much more important jobs than I do at, at Microsoft. I mean, I report to the guy who reports to the guy who reports to Bomber. So uh, it's, you know, I don't, but look, I'm honestly not even thinking about that. I'm really happy doing what I'm doing, building Yammer, and, uh, uh, you know, just looking forward to keep doing that for, for a while. So, um, in closing, you've had a pretty good run here at the launch conference, right? And we were talking backstage, and you had yeah. uh, this incredible idea. Let's hear it. Well, I mean, the reality is there's so much interesting stuff going on out there. I mean, in the demo pit, on stage here. I mean, there's more than you know any human can keep track of, except for you. I think you're, <laughs> you're like the only one who can, can keep track of all this activity. Right. So, what I said to you is, you know, why don't you pick, say, the top five of these uh, launch conference startups every year? And uh, I'll invest, you know, I'll make an angel investment, say like $50,000 each. So we'll do a $250,000 little mini fund. And uh, you just pick the, the winners and, and, I'm, and I'm behind them. Wow. Big round of applause. You've just seen the formation on stage of the launch fund, I guess we'll call it. And yeah. So now every... And, and, uh, you know, and, and just, you know... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll give the, the, the launch conference a 20% carry like a VC would take, so yes. that if, if you pick the winner, you pick well, so if the we money had will done go that, into the conference. Let's, let's put this in perspective. Yeah. If the launch fund had existed with Yammer, at the right. time Yammer launched, what was the valuation approximately, 100 million? When Yammer launched? No, yeah. I mean, we fought to get a, we, we raised, on the heels of winning the, the conference, we raised $5 million at a 20 post, so 15 pre. So if we had put 50,000 in, right. it would have grown 50x? It, it, we would have made about six, I think the Series A guys made about 60x. 60 times 50. Yeah. So basically it went from 20 million to 1.2 billion. I, 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 what would $50,000? Uh, 50, so oh, 50,000 times 60. Would be, you're having a little trouble with the math? Uh, that'd be 3 million. You would have gone from 50,000 to 3 million. So that's about 3. Three times, I'm just letting you know the significance of this. That's three times the budget. This event cost a million dollars to put on. Mm -hmm. So what you've just done is inevitably, we will have another Yammer. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, we hope. But if we even had half of another Yammer right. every year or every other year, it would pay for the entire budget of the conference two or three times over. Yeah. Good. Let's do it. Pick one. Let's do All it. right. Let's hear it for <laughs> David Sachs and the, the creation on stage of the launch fund. Um, David Sachs, it's been an honor to um, have been with you from the rehearsals uh, and to have become your friend over the years and mm -hmm. lost a shit ton of money to you playing poker and uh, being absolute. Maybe, maybe I can fund the launch fund with 
Yes, Good with book. the losses. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and just so people know, Chamath, um, we, we talked yesterday about Chamath being probably the best, one of the best players in the group. It's, right. it's pretty much neck and neck between the two of you. Who's the better poker player, you or Chamath? Um, probably, oh, I hate to say it. I can't even say it. You have to say it. Be objective. Um, honestly, it's, oh, it's, uh, I mean, I, I think I think we both know it's Chamath, but I. Uh, you can't like, say it. It's saying it's like so hard, yeah. Because then you have to play him. Yeah, I gotta play him, and he's gonna be really obnoxious about it. Right. So, so we won't say it, but we all know it. Um, the most successful entrepreneur in the history of the launch conference, David Sachs. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you.